Uh, okay, so I um, wanted to say one, one note of review, maybe to follow up to the question that I was just talking to Jamie about um, relate, regarding the percentiles of a continuous distribution. Uh, this was something that we looked at on, on Monday, but again, just wanted to kind of reiterate. I think one of your homework problems asks you to uh, give a formula, sort of a generic formula for the, um, for the percentile of a distribution. And um, I think maybe it was it earlier in that same problem you were asked to find the CDF, so you, you, found, you found this thing, but you, you found it as a function of, of x. Um, and so again, the percentile for, for generic p between 0 and 1, um, the, what, what I'm asking you to say is what, what's, uh, sol solve that thing backwards for x. So tell me if I want, if I want the 65th percentile, what, is the, what, what x value does that have to be to give, me that, to give me that area under the curve, to give me the shaded area under the curve to be equal to um, 0.65 or, or, or a, generic, a generic number between 0 and 1. So when you have the CDF, you just kind of need to solve that backwards, set that equal to P and solve it backwards in terms of X. So that's just a little, a little hint there. And uh, also before we move on to new material today, I wanted to try something a little different uh, and do actually do like a work problem in here for like five minutes. Um, so as I, I guess I didn't email this yesterday, but there is a practice exam posted on Carmen now. So some good practice problems for you to look over. This is part of one of those practice problems. And I'm going to go ahead and take, let's take like five minutes, and you guys, I would maybe pick out one of these, A, B, or C, and give it a try. Uh, I think they probably get increasingly more difficult. So you can, if you want to challenge yourself with one of the lower ones or start, start easier with, one, with A or B. Um, let's take five minutes for you guys to work on one, maybe one of these, A, B, or C, and then we'll kind of talk through the answers. And if you want to skip over part A, um, I think I need to tell you what K is. Um, so hopefully this doesn't ruin anyone's interest in doing part A, but K should be 10 over 81 if you, if you want to start on part B or C. So it's 807. Let's take till 812 to go ahead and work on one part of this, and then we'll come back together and um, discuss the answers. So can everybody see this okay? All right, if you want to wrap up the section you're working on, and we'll see about this one. So first, first, uh, well, I feel like I'm not going to actually walk through part A again. Uh, I think we've done that a lot of times, practicing the integration there. And we'll see that a little bit in part B. Um, so anybody, was everybody who tried part A able to get 10 over 81 for, for what K should be equal to? I might try that one. Maybe nobody tried that. Um, so that's uh, there's a solution on uh, on Carmen if you want to check that out. Um, we'll go ahead and jump on to move on to part part B here. Uh, so the question says how many? So again, the the PDF that we're looking at here, we're talking about a I should say a random variable, which is talking about weekly demand for gasoline at a service station. And uh, so we want to know how many thousand gallons should the service station expect to sell. So. The wording's maybe kind of obvious there, but what uh, what calculation am I going to do here? Yes, sir. Expected value. Expected value of x. Exactly right. So uh, we had our formula for what the. Uh oh. Okay. Uh, so again, sorry, my pen is acting up a little a little bit here. So I, if I want the if I want how much how much gas the service station <laughs> uh, is expecting to sell again, then I want to calculate the expected value. So um, sort of in lieu of working through this whole this whole calculation here, um, anybody want to volunteer an answer for what they got here for Part B or Part A? <laughs> yes, sir. 5.28. Sounds good to me. 5.28. Sorry. 82. That's right. Yeah. 827, even if you want to take it out that far. Nicely done. Um, so let's all review. Uh, we won't talk a lot about integration in this class, but let's all remember what the integral of 1 over x dx is. What's that? What's that equal to? 
Natural log of x, exactly. So that's that was a good thing to remember for that. If you didn't know how to do that, then you might have been out of luck there. Um, Otherwise, calculations pretty pretty similar to what we've done before. Uh, this this last part was a little different though, so I wanted to kind of um, and this kind of gets back at the percentile question that we talked about a little bit on Monday. Uh, so how much fuel how much fuel should the service station have at the beginning of the week in order to satisfy 95% of the demand for that week? So if they want to satisfy 95% of the people that will come in, um, how much do they need to have? So I'll give you a little hint there, but what's so how how are you gonna how would you set up this problem? Anyone who took this one on? How did you set it up? Yeah. Exactly right. So I want to so set point nine five equal to what? And then in Oh, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I want to take, uh, right, so I want to integrate the PDF from 1 up to some value x, and I need to find what x is, is the point there. Yeah. So I need to figure out what value of x, <clears throat> I need to f calculate this thing in terms of, in terms of x. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me, again, the, the PDF here, 1 up to x is uh, 10 over 81 times 1 minus 1 over y squared dy. And I'll do a, everyone's favorite dot, dot, dot. That's equal to um, 10 over 81 times x squared plus 1 over x minus 2. So hopefully integration should have been that. should not be too complicated to get to there. And this is kind of like that example. Then we just need to solve... We need to solve this equation for x. Um, so you can do some rearranging. Uh, did anybody, was anybody able to figure out what x should be? So maybe if we rewrite this as um, in our favorite quadratic form here, this is uh, that would be if, if and only if a squared minus. Um, so, if and only if, sorry, that should be an x. So, if you just do some rearranging that formula there. And then solve for x, so you got to work out the old quadratic formula there. Anybody, was anybody able to solve this one? Just kind of leave it, leave it there since you didn't have that at your disposal. <laughs> I always have to double check what the quadratic formula is. So you should get that uh, x is equal to um, 9.591. So again, it's the quadratic formula. You'll get a, a equals plus or minus something. Um, only or a, x sorry equals one of one of two things. But again, we have to have x be bigger than one because of this right there. So x has to be bigger than one. So you'll take the the solution to that formula that's that's bigger than one. Questions or comments? Is that is that what you guys did? Is that is that okay? Okay, I will take your silence as a yes. <laughs> um, okay, so the, there's a there's another part or two on that problem if you want to check it out on the exam review. But again, that is posted now. The exam review is, is much longer than the exam is going to be, although it's the same format. Uh, the exam will have um, somewhere between four and five, four or five questions. All will be written questions that are sort of like sort of like this and sort of like the problems that are on the exam review. Yeah. Will there ever be two values that are within the interval? Uh, will there ever be two values that are within the interval? Uh, no, there will not. There will not. Because again, there's only one. Think about the picture of this. Think about the picture of this PDF. It's going to be something like, so here's one, here's 10. It'll be something like, like that. 
And so there's only one value on there that gives you, you know, 95% of the area below it. There would be another value that gave you 95% of the area maybe above it, but I mean, that would be setting up the problem a little differently. So um, there should only just be one, one answer there. Any other questions, comments? You guys okay? All right, well, we're going to forge ahead then into some new material that will not be on the exam, but we're going to start talking about it anyway. Uh, and this is section 4.3, and this brings us to um, sort of the first major distribution that's for a continuous random variable that has a name. We talked about the uniform distribution. This is kind of, we're going to be talking about more of these for the rest of this chapter. Okay, so the normal distribution is uh, is very important. It's probably the most most important continuous distribution we'll, we'll talk about, or or it is the most important. Um, and it has it's very useful sort of it has very useful theoretical properties, which we'll see some later. Is this idea of the central limit theorem? Um, anybody heard of that before? Central limit, yeah. Maybe if you're in your other stat courses you've taken, maybe earlier. Um, but it, it's used for many many physical measurements. Uh, I mean, and any number of things, height, weight, sometimes can be approximated with these, uh, with this distribution. And uh, it's, so, so far we've seen our, these, these distributions are, have parameters involved with them. The binomial had a, a, a success probability P. Um, the Poisson distribution had, had a mu for its, for the expected number of, of occurrences. Um, the normal distribution is defined by two parameters, the mean and the variance. So keep the same symbols that we've used before. The mean is mu and the variance sigma squared. And so as usual we can we can talk about all the all our favorite properties of these continuous distributions. Um, a random variable that has a normal distribution with mean mu and variance sigma squared is given by that. Its PDF is given by that kind of messy formula there. Um, and the the important thing to note here is that x could be any number. It could be anything from all the way getting out to negative infinity to all the way up to positive infinity. So that's one reason this is a desirable distribution for measurements because there's no sort of endpoints that you have to worry about. It can be any any range of values there. Um, and our notation then is we're going to use a capital letter N and then in parentheses we'll put mean as to N variance. Um, although just just be careful I guess in some, some other cases it, they might uh, write this in terms of the mean and the standard deviation, so they might write a mu and a sigma. Um, we'll use we'll use the mean and variance, but just a heads up that that could be that could show up elsewhere. So again, here's our PDF. There's what our notation is going to be for the normal distribution. Okay, so um, this is whether you know it or not. This is probably something that you've seen before. Uh, the normal distribution has this nice. This nice bell-shaped, it's, it's, the, it's the classic bell curve. That's what the normal distribution is. Um, so it, again, kind of doesn't have any at limits on the endpoints. It can go off. It can be as big or as small as you want x to be. Um, and then it kind of has that, yeah, that nice, that nice bell-shaped curve. And um, the reason that it can be, well, the mean and the standard deviation of the mean and the variance kind of visually have some nice interpretations here. Um, so maybe what, what do you... What do you notice? What, what what do you notice about the shape of this, or sort of the, the the appearance of this of these distributions? Are they? Um, symmetric. Okay, thank you. They are symmetric. I didn't know if I <laughs> worded that well enough, but they are they are symmetric. So they kind of each of these curves has this nice right down the middle. You can reflect it back upon upon itself, and actually that point that point is right where the mean is. So the mean is going to be right in the middle of this thing. Um, Think about the balancing point of that distribution. It'll be right, right there in the middle as the mean. Um, and again, the standard deviation you can't you can't see it necessarily from just looking at the graph. But uh, again, sort of qualitatively, it allows us to see the standard deviation tells us sort of how spread out the distribution is. So a larger standard deviation or a larger variance means that the curve is going to be more spread out. So the red curve there has a a larger standard deviation than the than the dashed blue curve. Um, so maybe here's more of a visual way of how to think about the standard deviation as it tells us how sort of spread out or how squished in the, the normal curve would be um, depending on what its standard deviation is. Um, and yeah, again, you can't, you can't really see, just from looking at the curve, you couldn't tell me what the standard deviation is. Um, 
but just kind of thinking about the mean, the mean's going to be right there at the middle of that thing. So this is the, the red curve from the previous slide. And the standard deviation kind of goes out on either side. And we could talk about two standard deviations away from the mean. It would, it would look, we'll look at that in just a second, actually. Um, so yes, yeah, so it's, um, I guess, maybe a few comments to make about this, just sort of formally here. It is a symmetric. It is a symmetric distribution. So that was something we already said. Um, and, I, and I guess we'll say the, uh, maybe you can better see this on the previous slide, but um, larger standard deviation means more spread out. That's again kind of what I just said. Um, but then we won't go about proving this, but uh, the, another mathematical fact here is that the, in, the inflection points of that curve, so where it changes concavity there, are actually right where that one standard deviation away is. So um, the inflection points are at um, mu plus or minus plus or minus sigma. So that's kind of maybe a Again, something you might not be able to see exactly from this from this thing, but if you did the calculations, that's that's what you would get. So again, this is this is a very important distribution. We'll we'll spend a little time talking about it here, but we'll use it much more. We'll use sort of the same types of techniques later in the semester um, as we progress through the course. So uh, the standard deviations as you go one, two, and three standard deviations away from the mean also have sort of a nice, a nice interpretational property. This is the 68, 99.7 rule. Um, so here's my normal curve. Again, remember it's centered at, centered at mu. Uh, the red dashed here is plus or minus sigma, so mu plus sigma and mu minus sigma. Um, if I go the same distance out further away, uh, this is going to be mu plus two sigma. Down here is mu minus 2 sigma. And then you can't really see it, but right there is another, another standard deviation. This is mu plus 3 sigma and mu minus 3 sigma. So as you kind of get further away from the mean, we can talk about how much area is contained under the, under the curve there. Sort of, a, sort of just a very quick way of, of assessing probabilities. Um, so the, this rule tells us that um, if I if I go between plus and minus one standard deviation from the mean, this is 68% uh, of the area under the curve. So if I were to shade in, in the area underneath the curve, that would be 68% or 0.68. Um, if I go out to the two standard deviation mark, this is going to be 95%, approximately 95% of the area. My pen is not cooperating today. There we go. So again, we're talking about area under the curve here. So the shaded area under the curve between uh, mu minus 2 sigma and mu plus 2 sigma is 95%. And then you guessed it. If you go out here to the 3 plus or minus 3 standard deviations, that's going to be 99.7 percent. So if I ask you what's the probability of being within one standard deviation for a normal random variable, 68 percent, and you could answer the same questions for two and three. So we'll talk, again, there's obviously there's many times you would want to calculate probabilities for just any number, and we'll talk about how to do that, but kind of as a very quick way, this is the a nice property of the normal distribution. Okay, so in general, if I want to know something about a general probability for uh, x being between a and b, so again, what the previous slide said was that if x, the probability that x is between uh, mu minus sigma and mu plus sigma, that was 0.68. So that's something that the previous slide told us. But again, if I want to do that for a generic number, generic numbers A and B, 
Uh, again, we know that that requires doing an integration over the over the PDF. So integrating the probability density function between between two values a and b. And the good or maybe bad news, well, bad or maybe good news is that uh, it's not possible to do. <laughs> so you can't sit down by hand and, and calculate what what that what that thing is in in general. It is possible using some integration tricks to show that the PDF integrates to one. Um, if you were to go from plus uh, minus infinity up to positive infinity, it is possible to show that, that integrates to one, but for general numbers you can't you can't do that calculation. Um, so once uh, so so what what can we do about this? Um, this leads us to the idea of of uh, of a standard normal distribution. So again, we can kind of think about how to calculate probabilities for a, for a special case and then how can we generalize that to something more useful. But anyway, this thing is called the standard normal distribution because the mean the mean is 0 and the standard deviation is 1. Um, so it's 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 been standardized. Um, and again, you could just take the PDF that we post that I posted earlier and plug in mu equals 0 and sigma equals 1 and that's the PDF that you would get. So again, um, this is what this is the standard normal random variable, and uh, our notation we're going to use the the letter Z, use the capital letter Z. So that's something we'll see a lot in the the rest of the semester. And we'll do Z uh, is distributed as normal normal zero one there. <clears throat> and of course the the CDF of this thing is is just what you think it is, probably being less than or equal to some lowercase Z is just integral from negative infinity to, to lowercase z of that of the PDF. And we'll use some special notation for this too, which is a capital letter phi. Um, that will be our special notation for the PD, for the CDF of the standard normal random variable. So instead of using the capital F, we'll use the we'll use a capital phi. And then again, again, we it's still not possible to calculate that that thing by hand. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to use use a table, kind of like we've started doing for some of our other other random variables, where you maybe could actually calculate those by hand. Uh, we will actually be forced to go to the table for these things. Um, and you ask how do they how do they calculate these these, these table values? If it's not possible, they they would have done some sort of a numerical estimate uh, approximation type of a thing. But anyway, this is uh, this is table A3 in the back of your book. I have it um, I have it a little bit later in your notes. I think on page 14 and 15, um, but we'll take take a look at it here. Um, and so we can use this both to find probabilities, but also to find percentiles. So we'll we'll take a look at how to do how to do each one of those. Uh, so some more notation for you here. Um, Remember, in general, our percentiles we use some some different notation in general. But for the for the standard normal distribution, we'll use this special um, lowercase z sub sub alpha, and that will just be the value on the normal curve such that the er probability of being bigger than that is is alpha. So um, whatever alpha is between zero and one, um, that's our that's what our notation is going to be. So if I want the probability bigger than that number to be alpha, then I can, I can figure out what that is. Um, and ju just to note that this is a symmetric distribution, so uh, when you come down here, if you want this, this area to also be equal to alpha, then this will be equal to negative, negative z sub alpha. So again, we're going on either side of zero, the same distance away from the center there. Um, symmetry gives us that, gives us that there. Uh, questions, questions, comments. Is, is, have you guys seen this stuff before? Is this, is this new? Is this not new? It's new. So again, the same, the same thing that we've been doing all along here still applies. Uh, we're just kind of inserting a different distribution here, and we'll kind of practice practice doing the same types of things that we have seen before. So, again. Using the table to find some probabilities for my standard normal random variable again, here z is distributed as a normal zero one, 
Uh, so I, I don't know. For me, pictures always are helpful for this thing. So if you practice it yourself, you'll find that drawing a normal curve is very difficult. <laughs> but this is my z here. It's the distribution centered at zero. And uh, I want a probability that z is less than 1.52. So let's come up here to 1.52. And then what's the, what shaded area do I want in here? Do I want to find on this in, under this curve? Everybody said to the left, right? I want less than or equal to 1.52. So I want to know what, what that area right there is. And so again, we're going to use, again, if this was a different distribution, you would set up the integral going from whatever the lower endpoint was up to 1.52, and you could do that by hand. Um, since that's not possible here, we, we, we're going to use the table, and I'll show you, show you how to do this. Um, so again, this, this table is page 14 and 15 of your notes. Um, but so if I, want, if I want the probability of, of 1.52, well, 1.52 is equal to 1.5 plus 0 0.02. Um, so what well, I'm going to be looking in the margins of this table for whatever that z value is. Um, so the, the, uh, the column on the far left gives me the tenths place, the, the uh, ones and tenths place. So if I want 1.52, I come down here um, to 1.5. And then if I want uh, 1.52, I can come over uh, 0 .0, 0 0.0, and 0 0.02. So it's kind of like uh, I've got to find the, find the column in the row that I want to be in and then find the, the number that's, that's in the middle there. So I'll trace this one over and bring this, bring this down. And it's maybe a little hard to see from where you're sitting, but... Um, the probability there is 0.9357. So, um, probability that z is less than 1.52 is 0.9357. So, uh, let me just jump. So, this this is I should I should have mentioned this, but the table will give you. Uh, this is the another part of the table. The table will give you the the CDF value for, for what you're looking at. It'll give you the area to the left and up to that up to that endpoint. So what's what's given in the table is going to be the shaded area uh, to the left of whatever number you're looking at. So that's why I can just pull out um, 0.9357. That's the area to the left of 1.52 under that curve. Is everybody okay with what I'm doing here? Okay, well, let's do a few more examples of this. Uh, so what about, what about z bigger than 2.3? Uh, so I'm going to draw my picture again. Centered at 0. Here's z. And I want to know something about 2.3. So what area do I shade in under the curve here? Everybody said to the right. One person said. <laughs> so now I want, to know what, I want to know what this probability is. Um, and so remember the table. The table gives me areas to the left. So I, if I look up 2.3 in the table, it'll give me this this area down here. But that's okay. We know we know how to do how to deal with that. This is just equal to one minus the probability that uh, z is less than or equal to 2.3. Say that again. So because of the, does that make you happy? Is that what you were saying? Yeah. So, so maybe to be technical, maybe to be formal, that's the better way to do it. But um, remember, for a continuous random variable, the probability of being equal to any particular number is is just zero. So, um, so we said. Uh, so for example, the probability that z is less than or equal to 2.3. You could write that as the probability that z is less than 2.3 plus the probability that z equals 2.3. Um, but again, that thing's equal to zero. So either way you want to write, it's fine. Um, 
you can be a little bit less, a little more careless with your endpoints on uh, these continuous distributions. So I'm going to keep that there just since that's what the table is going to give us. Okay, so to find area to the right, I can just take, find the area to the left and subtract from one. So now I can go back to my table. I want 2.3. Again, that's equal to 2.3 plus 0, 0.00. That's a little obvious. Um, so I have not included that part of this table, haven't I? Well, that's bad. So, <laughs> so if you if you trace this down a little further, you'll find the 2.3 row. <laughs> I cut that off for thought I included that. Um, and then we want to go. So you'll get down to the 2.3 row down here somewhere. And we want to be in the 0 .00 column. And uh, if you get down to that number, you'll find 0 0.9893. So if you want to flip back to page. 14 in your notes, you can double check that that is, that is what it says. Um, so this is going to be equal to 1 minus 0 0.9893 or 0 0.0107. Everybody okay with this? Any question you guys can think of? It's okay so far? Uh, okay, so like I said, we can also find the we can also find percentiles using using these using this table. So if I'm with the twentieth percentile. Here's my distribution. Let's try that again. Centered at zero. If I want the twentieth percentile, what sort of what shaded area would that correspond to? Somewhere somewhere to the left. So I want I want. Uh, probably being less than or equal to this value. I want this to be equal to 20% or 0.2. So now I need to figure out what z value will give me a probability of, of 0.2. Um, so again, we can use the table, the table to find this. Um, and if I, want, if I know that the shaded area to the left is, is 0.2, uh, and I want to find, solve backwards. Now I want to look inside the table. So I want to kind of start looking around in here for a number that's close to 0.2. And again, you're not going to find something exactly equal to it, but um, there's a 0 0.2005. So that's, that's pretty darn close, so we'll go with that. Um, and now I just need to figure out what, what z value that corresponds to, and I can just trace that back over to here and figure out what column I'm in. So that means I'm at um, negative 0.84. So, the, so one half the table has positive numbers in this column here, and the other half has negative numbers. Um, and you might, might need either side of that table. So that tells me that this number right here is, um, now figure this is negative 0.84. So what that tells me is that the probability of z being less than or equal to negative 0.84 is equal to is approximately equal to that 20th percentile there. Yeah. Um, when solving problems like this that just generally have a distribution, do you require to draw the distribution? Mm. Inside? So are you are re are you required to draw the distribution? Absolutely not. Uh, I think it's. It works for me. If it doesn't work for you, that's totally fine. Uh, whatever, whatever is easiest for you. I think it, if the problems get more complicated, you want to. I mean, I, th I think it helps you see exactly what shaded area I want there. But um, if you can do it without that, that's totally fine. That will not be a requirement for homework or whatnot. <clears throat> Okay, uh, I guess one more one more question we can answer here is if we want to find a symmetric interval that contains ninety five percent probability. Um, so, show you what I mean by this. Here is my z centered at zero. I want to find a symmetric interval, so plus or minus something uh, that gives me ninety five p 
percent of the probability. So that means I want to go down a certain distance and up a certain distance. So let's say um, whatever those numbers are, such that in here is 95% 95, 95 of the probability in there. So from what we said earlier, what, you, what would your approximate answer to this question be? Right, so you know it's going to be something close to, this should be close to negative 2 and close to positive 2. Again, the 68, 99.7 rule is not exactly, <laughs> it's not exactly 1, 2, and 3. Um, so we'll show you how to do this in general. But again, your intuition should be that it's close to plus or minus 2 here. Um, so either way, if I want 95% of the area to be um, in the kind of the big part of the, the distribution there, how much, how much do I need to have down in this lower tail that I just shaded in? Did you say? 2.5%, exactly right. So again, the, all the area under the curve is 1. So in the tails, I need to have 5% total divided by 2 is, I want this to be 2.5% or 0 0.025. Um, and again, if I go back to the table, uh, let's try let's try this. Well, <laughs> so that's that'll be 0 0.25 down there, 0 0.25 up here as well, 0 0.025. Um, and so if I go all the way up to 0 0.025, all the way up to that should be 0 0.975. So adding all the way up to that. Um, we want to find the z value that gives us 97.5 percent of the probability uh, to the left. If I had the full table there, you could also just look up this number in the table, but um, I also did not include that part of the table. So we'll look at look at this other thing. Um, if I want 97.5 percent of the area, wow. Well, I did not include either parts of this table. I thought I did. Well, what <laughs> if you look at your table, actually, since you guys all have this in your notes, um, either look up 0 0.9975 or 0 0.025 and tell me, tell me what you find. So flip back to page 14 and 15 and look up one of those probabilities. We'll get some, get some class participation going here. Yeah, so it's, you want to be in the negative 1.9 row or the positive 1.9, depending on which one you're looking up here. And then the hundreds place is going to be what? I think I heard it. Six, right. So this, this is not actually negative 2. It's going to be 1.9, 1.96 there. So the interval that would contain 95% of the probability would be, uh, sorry, that's a negative 1.96 up to positive 1.96. So yeah, so the table, the table is not that, I think you probably catch on pretty quickly, but uh, it's a little, can be a little clunky sometimes. Okay, questions or comments you guys can think of on, on this? Is this feeling okay so far? Well, as, as you might imagine, uh, it'd be hard to think of a situation where you had a standard normal random variable, something that you were measuring that had mean zero and standard deviation exactly equal to one. Um, so, so this would sort of never actually show up in real in real life. Um, but we can use this. Uh, we can use a trick to kind of um, do the same type of calculation for any normal distribution that we're looking at. Um, again, so for our for our general normal random variable that has mean mu and variance sigma squared. Um, we can we can standardize uh, we can standardize that that random variable. So this is the standardized random variable. And so I'm just going to subtract off the mean. So I'm going to take x minus its mean, x minus mu, and I'm going to divide by the standard deviation. And if I do that calculation, that will give me a random variable that is that is equal that is a standard normal random variable. Um, 
So again, I'm going to take uh, z, the kind of the important calculation. I'm going to take x minus its mean and divide by its standard deviation. So that if x has a normal uh, mean mu variance sigma squared distribution, then z, if I do that calculation, will have a normal 0, 1 uh, distribution. So it's kind of our, our first look at a, at a transform, transformation of a, of a random variable here. And so then if I want to find uh, some generic probability involving, involving x between two values, um, I can, I can uh, again, inside the probability statement, uh, any of your normal algebra tricks work. So if I take x minus mu and divide by sigma, if I subtract off mu and divide by sigma of everything inside there, um, it's still the same thing. And once, it, once it's something involving z, we kind of know how to do that. That's what we were just looking at. Um, so that will be the CDF at this point minus the CDF at that point. Um, and maybe this is maybe this is a little bit more familiar. Probably being less than of x is less than or equal to a is just the CDF of the standard normal evaluated at um, a minus mu over over sigma. So the same kind of tricks work out here, um, and. Uh, we can use the same, we can use the same uh, strategies that we did to find probabilities on that previous example. Okay, let's, let's at least start a quick example here and, um, and uh, see how to actually apply this thing. So talk about mopeds. Does anybody in here have a moped? I wish, right? I do not have a moped. But anyway, they're very popular in Europe. Um, and here we have a... Uh, a study of these things, and um, for looking at the maximum vehicle speed here, uh, we have a normal distribution with mean 46.8 kilometers per hour and a standard deviation 1.75 kilometers per hour. So we're looking at the speed of these things, and uh, we're going to say that it has a a normal distribution. So if x um, if x equals the the maximum vehicle speed for this particular type of moped we can say that x has a normal distribution with mean 46.8 and standard deviation 1.75 so the variance is 1.75 squared okay so we're going to ignore how they maybe got to this uh, distribution assumption here, but uh, we'll just take that as, as truth for now. And we can answer some, some, prob some questions like we, like we just answered. Uh, so for example, what's the probability that the maximum speed is at most 50 miles per hour? So that's the prob what's, what probability do I want to know about x? If it's at most 50 miles per hour? Less than or equal to 50, exactly. Um, again, so if I want to standardize this thing to use the z-table, um, I'm just going to take, I'm going to subtract off the mean and divide by the standard deviation, so x minus 46.8, um, divided by the standard deviation, 1.75, and I'll do the same thing for 50. And again, because uh, because this thing has a that's that's equal to z, which is our standard normal random variable. This is just equal to the probability that z is less than or equal to. And if you calculate that out, you'll get 1.83. So the probability that x is less than 50 is the same as the probability that z is less than or equal to 1.83. And um, if you look that up in the table. I'll leave that as an exercise. That should be um, 0.9664. And very quickly, just to finish out, we'll do this, the second one. I want the probability that the maximum speed is at least 48 miles per hour. So how would I write that down? Probability of x is what? Greater than or equal to now. Uh, 48. Again, this is, if I do, is the same as the z random variable being bigger than 48 minus 46.8 divided by 1.75. So 
So just subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation on each side of that inequality. The probability that z is bigger than or equal to uh, 0 0.69. Again, that's 1 minus the probability that z is less than 0.69, which if you look that up in the table should give you um, 0 0.25451. I'm skipping over the steps of actually looking this thing up in the table, um, I would double check that for yourself. All right, I'm out of time. Thank you guys so much for being here. Um, see you guys on Friday. Stay, stay safe out there. <laughs>